live, but mostly recorded, digitized and distributed for your listening and learning pleasure. It's Mostly Accurate Lectures with Professor Mitchell, the series that answers the questions you might not have cared to ask. Professor Mitchell is an Associate Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Psychologist who specializes in questionable, sarcastic comments and failures to return emails. So sit back, relax, pay attention, and ask yourself, Are you ready? psychiatric or psychological professional. Uh, many people have gone as far as to call schizophrenia the cancer of the psychiatric world. Um, that is uh, actually a relatively good analysis because like with any, uh, any cancer, schizophrenia can uh, be dormant for quite some time. Uh, it can affect the person significantly or it can uh, allow the person or the person can allow themselves to uh, cope very well throughout their entire life with the diagnosis and with the symptoms. So uh, a good analogy uh, and uh, I think it really speaks to the severity of the diagnosis itself. We'll look at the capacity of someone with schizophrenia to work and uh, what the current and future treatments are for people with schizophrenia. According to the DSM-4, which, uh, as we say with every lecture this semester, um, it is somewhat of a historical document at this point as we are at transition to the DSM-5, uh, but the DSM-4-TR criteria for schizophrenia is that you're going to have um, some characteristic symptoms, which means that there are some symptoms that uh, you will see within people with schizophrenia. They may not have all of them, but they do usually share some uh, similar uh, pathological issues. There is a social and or occupational dysfunction. Uh, duration must be greater than six months, which means that um, there are some differential diagnoses or some um, issues that can lead to uh, a more acute psychotic disorder, uh, but of course schizophrenia can be the correct diagnosis and has to be uh, present for at least six months. Um, schizoaffective and mood disorder exclusion, what that means is that if someone has schizoaffective disorder, they are not going to uh, meet the criteria for schizophrenia. These are not uh, diagnoses that can be coordinated with one another. Um, same thing with the substance abuse disorders. Uh, I think for most people, it stands to reason that if you have a psychotic disorder that is brought about by uh, narcotic abuse, that would preclude you from uh, a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Uh, however, there are people who will use psychiatric uh, drugs or psychotropic drugs or uh, illicit uh, drugs, psychi psychoactive drugs, uh, that will also have schizophrenia. So simply using uh, a, a 
substance does not preclude someone from having schizophrenia, but if we can trace the etiology back to the drug, uh, that would not be considered schizophrenia. Same thing with general medical condition. Uh, somebody with a brain tumor that is causing them to have visual or auditory hallucinations, uh, we would not uh, consider them to have schizophrenia. However, when we go over the uh, the, the medical or biological uh, basis for schizophrenia, we're going to see that there are some significant uh, brain issues, physiological brain issues, that most people with schizophrenia have, uh, but those would not be a general medical exclusion. Um, and there is a relationship to pervasive de developmental disorders. A lot of the criteria that you're going to hear for schizophrenia uh, sound incredibly similar to the developmental disorders that you will see uh, in the autistic spectrum or with a person with Down syndrome. Um, these can be comorbid. You can see somebody with a developmental disability with schizophrenia. However, one normally will explain the other. When we look at the diagnostic uh, process for schizophrenia, uh, this is much like any other diagnostic process. You're, you're going to begin with the, uh, the clinical interview, um, but uh, when you're looking or you're working with somebody with schizophrenia, you're going to want to look at Axis 3 very, very carefully uh, and rule out any physical or biological abnormality um, outside of the scope of schizophrenia. So. Uh, a lot of people will will put somebody through a CT, MRI, PET scan just to uh, just to see if there's anything there. But by and large, that's really not helpful in the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, it can it can show if there is some significant impairment, but for the most part, if somebody's to the point where uh, they're seeking a psychiatric consult, there's usually nothing nothing else going on with that individual that would indicate uh, a medical issue, and therefore. The bigger things we want to look at are medical history and um, substance abuse in the past. Um, most of the time, we're going to we're going to make the diagnosis here strictly from um, a mental status exam, a history, and a lot of times we're going to get that history not from the identified patient, but from uh, somebody who is actually helping that patient get set up in psychiatric consult. Um, what's very interesting is that a lot of times the reliability of the, uh, the historical information given by somebody with schizophrenia will actually indicate um, issues that would, that would lead up to a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Because a lot of times with paranoid ideations or um, delusions of grandiosity or reference, um, their uh, perception of the world will be skewed in such a way that um, actually having a poor historian in the client indicates that they are probably suffering from a psychotic disorder such as schizophrenia. Um, you know, looking back at the history of things like phrenology, where we, uh, where, you know, the early, early psychologists or the early biopsychologists would uh, use phrenology to rub their hands over a person's head to see if they were vivids or excesses in the skull. Uh, there's really no biomarkers for the diagnosis or severity. You can't look at somebody like a Down syndrome say, well, that person looks like that's schizophrenia, um, nor can we even look at the brain with the technology that's commonly used and say, well, wow, that's a person with schizophrenia. There's not going to be any biomarkers for the diagnosis of this. Um, when we look at schizophrenia, we are looking at two marked uh, types of symptoms. We have positive symptoms and negative symptoms. Uh, and we're not talking good and bad here. We're talking about um, positive and negative in the same way that we talked about it in Psych 101 with operant conditioning. In operant conditioning, when you, when you use a reinforcer, uh, a positive reinforcer adds something to the equation, a negative reinforcer takes something away from the equation, both of them will increase the probability that the behavior will, will occur in the future. Not exactly the same with schizophrenia and um, with, with symptoms, but similar. Because what we're looking at is a positive symptom is something that is in excess of what the um, average or normal person, the non-psychotic uh, person, would have. So uh, obviously hallucinations would be a positive symptom. Somebody with schizophrenia is having more uh, uh, more hallucinations than the average or normal person. Uh, 
versus the negative symptoms, those are the things that people have a poverty of. Um, anhedonia, which is the uh, inability uh, to feel uh, any kind of pleasure, would be a negative symptom. Uh, apraxia, or positive, uh, I'm sorry, um, apraxia or alogia. Uh, alogia is the poverty of speech. Um, apraxia is an affective dysregulation. These are both symptoms that are uh, negative. Um, restricted affect, which um, a lot of times is called flat affect, where people express neither pleasure nor pain, would, would fall on the same as uh, alogia. Um, loss of volition or abolition, so people that become apathetic, that would be a negative symptom. And social withdrawal. Uh, a lot of times we see individuals will have social withdrawal. Um, and it's a, a chicken or the egg debate of is the schizophrenia causing them to be socially withdrawn because they have lost touch with reality, or um, are they losing touch with reality and that's exacerbating the schizophrenia? And we'll discuss that uh, as we go, as we talk about schizophrenia a little bit more. Um, audible thoughts, uh, those would be a positive symptom. Uh, hallucinations, auditory hallucinations, uh, voices arguing or commenting, uh, thought withdrawal or insertion by outside forces, that would be positive symptom. Thought broadcasting, this is a, uh, a, a, hallucination, uh, a, a hallucination and delusion uh, in which a person may, may even see their thoughts leaving their head, but the delusion, the delusional thought, is um, that other people are, are able to uh, receive their thoughts because they're being broadcast right out of their, their brain. Um, and then delusional perceptions, uh, those are uh, just the way that the person interprets things. Uh, slightly different from a hallucination, um, and we'll get into that here in just a second. So the symptoms, uh, when we look at this dimension, when we look at this as a list, the uh, psychotic symptoms, um, the two major psychotic symptoms in schizophrenia are hallucinations and delusions. And the best way to differentiate the two is to just remember that a delusion is an irrational thought, while a hallucination is a perception uh, that is either incorrect or is not in line with the actual um, sensation that is coming in. So there may be the lack of a sensation or the sensation may be coming in and being interpreted incorrectly. So with a visual hallucination, the person may see something that there is no sensation in. So if I am sitting here and I see four or five people standing in front of me, but there are no people there, uh, that means that the light waves that should be bouncing off their body coming back in through my eyes, going through my occipital lobe, uh, they, they don't exist. So my hallucination is completely fabricated of my mind. Um, and so when we think about a hallucination, we have to remember that we're, we're talking about something that can be one of two things. It can be something that's completely made up of the mind, or it can be something that is a misinterpretation of sensations that are actually out there, and that the person is just misinterpreting or, or, or taking information in, in, incorrectly. One of the more interesting uh, side notes that Homer's textbook talks about is um, is research that's done on what's called the Broca's area. Um, the, Broca, the Broca's area is a part of the brain that actually helps us interpret uh, speech, uh, vocabulary, syntax. Uh, Broca's area is activated. If we hook so somebody to uh, an fMRI or uh, a CAT scan or a CT where we're, we're actually able to see the activity of the brain, when somebody is fabricating a sentence, and they are uh, making up words and sentences, the Broca's area lights up with activity. And we look at people with schizophrenia who are actively engaged in an auditory hallucination. Uh, they are hearing something that is not really there. And when they report that those auditory hallucinations are words, are sentences, we can actually see the Broca's area light up the same way as if they were talking. So what this means, or what we believe this to mean, is that the Broca's area is actually activating and making up these words, or this syntax, or these, these, these sentences, and the mind is not, uh, is not able, the brain or the mind is not able to differentiate whether the Broca's area is creating these words or if some outside force is creating these words. 
And this is the major difference between somebody with schizophrenia and somebody who's not when it comes to auditory hallucinations. For the most part, a, uh, a, a non-schizophrenic individual, um, which we'll loosely call a normal person, um, knows when they're talking to themselves. They know when they're making up a thought. They know when they're making up sentences. But because there's some disconnect, there's some neurological uh, implications within the brain, the Broca's area is actually making up, or there's at least activity going on in the Broca's area, which would indicate that um, just as if it's activated in speech production, it's also activated in auditory hallucinations. So there seems to be some of a, somewhat of a disconnect there. Again, looking at the negative symptoms, impoverished speech, lack of motivation, asociality, decreased affect or flat affect, and then the neurocognitive imp uh, impairments, memory, attention, social cognition, disorganized speech. These are all, um, they could be categorized as psychotic, uh, but they are neurocognitive impairments. Let's look at the, uh, the actual prevalence, the epidemiology of schizophrenia and the prevalence within society. The lifetime prevalence is about 1%, and usually, usually again, we're looking at the United States here. Um, there is no um, epidemiological difference between uh, different races or different cultures, so we're looking at 1% across the board. Um, and this is one of those uh, diagnoses that we're actually at a one-to-one -one ratio um, or possibly even higher in males than females. Um, usually we see the, like the anxiety disorders or the mood disorders, we see a lot of uh, two-to-one ratio, female being the two with male being the one. Uh, here we're seeing at least a one-to-one -one ratio, and sometimes yeah, we look at numbers that are even closer to two-to-one male to female. Um, the onset in men is usually about the time uh, a man is uh, fully in adolescence. Um, it's not usually the beginning of puberty, but you know, adolescence has set in and they're they're starting to mature. Um, historically, we wouldn't say this is the the cusp of young adulthood. Whereas for females, it's it's more in middle to later young adulthood, 25 to 34. Um, and there's there's not a lot of research to show why this occurs. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of implications uh, with the dopamine theory of schizophrenia is that uh, overproduction is happening in males at a younger age um, versus uh, females at an older age, uh, which, which kind of goes in, in hand in hand with um, sexual maturation and uh, the sexual peak ages for individuals. Um, usually men hit their sexual peak at a little bit younger age, and, and that's when they're getting a lot of dopamine production, whereas females tend to hit their sexual peak at a little bit older age. Uh, that is purely conjecture. That is purely looking at the dopamine uh, theory, nothing that has been uh, empirically proven. Schizophrenia is a 
him, considered to be one of the more severe uh, psychiatric disorders that we have, people with schizophrenia have differing levels of, of symptom and, um, and, and how they function with that. Uh, some people will be able to function very well within society. Um, I think my, my favorite example of that would be uh, Dr. John Nash, who the movie A Beautiful Mind is based off of. Um, he had decades of lucidity and he's had, he's had decades of, of, of pathological symptomatic time for his schizophrenia. was debilitating. He needed to be um, hospitalized and institutionalized. Um, and, and even today, he is still symptomatic, uh, but he is able to control it. Very similar to somebody with ADHD who, uh, and I'm not comparing schizophrenia and ADHD in severity, but uh, a lot of times after years and years of having ADHD, get older, they, they learn how to deal with it on their own, be it by diet, be it by uh, how they function uh, in their job and in their life, uh, and, and, and at an earlier age they just can't cope with it as well as they can when they are older. Schizophrenia is kind of similar in the fact that a lot of people don't feel like they can the The level of care is going to be related to the symptoms, and uh, the amount of treatment that they can give is not Um, or is it debilitating? Is it voices that you can't get rid of? Um, going again back to Psych 101, we have the, the idea of habituation. Habituation is uh, when you hear a stimulus or you hear a sound or you're sensing something that is constantly there. Uh, and like uh, the air conditioning unit in your car, if you have, uh, or even your engine of your car, as you're driving and you first turn on the air conditioning unit, blowing sound is very loud, um, but as you uh, drive for a while, you can phase it out, it becomes part of the background until it's brought into your consciousness again. Uh, a lot of times, for some people with psychosis, things, uh, these are great hallucinations will be habituated, whereas they just it's part of the background, it's part of the noise, it's part of their, their real view, and so it may not be as distracting. And again, this speaks to the concept of as people being used to the diagnosis of the use of disorder, Do they influence behavior? Um, do the hallucinations make commands? Do they make them engage in things? Um, do they cause suffering? Or do they cause social impairment? Um, one of the biggest ones are paranoia and suspiciousness. That's going to impact and increase the severity of symptoms. The severity of the negative symptoms are usually related to social isolation. Um, a little bit of apathy, not really caring about what's going on in other people or even for themselves, and lack of expression. Blunted and flat aspect uh, will oftentimes have social implications. Uh, the severity of the cognitive impairments are related to basically just the, the fact that they have the, the issues with concentration and memory, the inability to interpret social signals, or the misinterpretation of social signals. Uh, Somebody asking you a question about how you're doing today. If you have Antipsychotic medications uh, will often help decrease the severity of psychiatric or psych, uh, psychotic symptoms. Usually will not do away with them completely, but uh, they will help decrease the severity. Um, there are some side effects that uh, uh, people tend not to like. Um, most of these involve uh, things that don't have anything to do with uh, uh, the actual symptoms that are being treated. Uh, there's a lot of sexual side effects, there's a lot of affective side effects, there's a lot of uh, behavioral side effects that people don't tend to like. 
Um, and antipsychotics are relatively ineffective for the negative and cognitive impairment. So they're really good at getting rid of psychotic um, positive symptoms, uh, such as hallucinations and delusions, but the other ones are, are much more treatment resistant. Um, the antipsychotic medications are really effective at presenting, preventing relapse in stabilized patients. However, once a person, once the effectiveness or the efficacy of the drug wears off, uh, most patients will stop taking the medications because they feel like they're not working. This is exacerbated by the fact that sometimes their symptoms will come back and the paranoid ideations will come back, causing them to even further uh, decrease their, uh, their medication compliance. And so they'll become very suspicious of anybody trying to get them to take their medications once the effectiveness starts to wear off and it becomes a very slippery slope. The clinical challenge um, is that a lot of people with schizophrenia um, either have had substance abuse issues in the past or will try to treat their uh, schizophrenia with a substance uh, before seeking out psychiatric help. And so a lot of times it will be difficult if somebody says, yes, I have a history of, of chronic um, LSD usage or heroin usage, a lot of times the diagnosis of schizophrenia will be pushed aside, um, hoping that possibly, you know, if we stop using the LSD, we stop using the heroin, we stop using the illicit drug, the psychotic symptoms will go away. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of times people are trying to manage their own psychosis with, uh, with a hallucinogenic drug or a psychoactive drug, and uh, failing to treat them because of this is actually just going to make it worse. This concludes the lecture for schizophrenia. Uh, specific information that uh, you may have questions about, we can address via email at bmitchell at ivytech.edu or in class. Uh, a few notes at the end of this. Uh, there are other psychotic disorders that we did not address in this lecture, such as uh, brief psychotic disorder, schizophreniform, schizoaffective disorder, delusional disorder, and substance-induced psychotic disorder. I do want to talk about a couple of those very quickly. Um, schizophreniform is essentially a differential or um, rule-out based diagnosis for schizophrenia. Schizophreniform is, uh, if you remember that schizophrenia needs to be present for at least six months before the diagnosis to be valid, if somebody were to come in and say, uh, you know, I've had, been having these delusions, I've been having these hallucinations for the last three months. Um, schizophreniform would be the correct diagnosis to give that person. It's a transitive diagnosis, meaning that eventually it's going to turn into something else. Schizophreniform is not something you will have for your entire life. If after six months or after three months uh, the symptoms persist, schizophreniform naturally rolls into schizophrenia. If they, uh, if they go away, Sometimes people will just let it go and say that it was an acute uh, schizophreniform issue. Um, other times it'll beg the question of, well, why did that happen and what do we need to be looking for in the future? So uh, just remember schizophreniform is a transitive psychotic disorder. It is acute in nature because if it's chronic, it will lead to uh, schizophrenia. And then um, schizoaffective disorder we already discussed just briefly. Schizoaffective disorder uh, is the uh, marked symptoms of both schizophrenia and a major depressive episode or a manic episode. So the way that I like to describe this very simply is you take schizophrenia and you take one of the bipolar disorders and you slap those two things together and you have schizoaffective disorder. Um, as you can see, this is one of, the, one of the most severe disorders you can have because not only are you having um, the psychotic issues of schizophrenia, but you're having the mood dysregulation of a bipolar or a depressive disorder can be incredibly, incredibly uh, difficult to work with. However, the interesting thing is there is a, uh, a newer drug on the market called Invega that was designed for schizoaffective disorder, and it has been very, very successful uh, in individuals with schizoaffective disorder, and it's also been used pretty prominently with people with developmental disabilities. Uh, people who have um, affective or mood dysregulation, a lot of times even aggressive tendencies, uh, schizoaffective, um, the schizoaffective drug uh, in Vega has been successful for those individuals in decreasing 
uh, those, those violent behaviors or those, uh, those aggressive type of behaviors. Um, you know, one passing or one final note uh, about the treatment of for schizophrenia. Um, there are the, the uh, psychoactive drugs or the psychiatric drugs have kind of taken over the treatment of schizophrenia. However, institutions um, can set up um, atmospheres that are more conducive for treatment. Um, the one thing that has really taken hold, and it's not really anything that's going to cure schizophrenia, but something called milieu therapy. And milieu therapy is basically just setting up an environment that is uh, that is comfortable for individuals with schizophrenia and, and not so clinical and not so jarring to them when they come in. Um, and this is, uh, you know, it's effective for most psychiatric disorders, but uh, it's, it's something that is very effective for people with, with schizophrenia. Um, looking at the um, antipsychotic medications, uh, they can be incredibly harsh. Um, there are uh, side effects that are um, somewhat debilitating, things such as uh, Parkinsonian symptoms uh, because of the dopamine theory of schizophrenia, that too much dopamine leads to schizophrenia. We know in Parkinson's there's a deficiency of, of dopamine, so people who take too much antipsychotic uh, medications oftentimes will get Parkinson's syndrome. Um, tardive dyskinesia, uh, this is uh, essentially um, tremoring or... Um, Again, Parkinson's-like syndrome, uh, specifically from taking specific anti-psychotic uh, drugs, and also very prominent out of the drug uh, lithium. That is a very common uh, result of uh, of taking lithium as part of dekinesia. Uh, psychotherapy is not uh, considered to be an incredibly effective modality by itself. Uh, psychotherapy, including family therapy and um, cognitive behavioral therapy, can be seen as effective when you take it, uh, when you combine it with antipsychotic medications. But uh, even going back to the 1940s, it was well known that Freudian psychoanalysis wasn't going to be effective for somebody with a psychotic disorder. Uh, and this is actually a, a statement made by the famed lobotomist uh, Walter Freeman, who was uh, known in the United States as, uh, you know, the the, pre, the the predominant lobotomist uh, through the 1940s and 50s, uh, he would speak to psychoanalysts very frequently and and uh, and really, you know, just talk about the effect of his lobotomies and how it would oftentimes diminish psychotic symptoms and would ask them, what can you, what is your uh, psychotherapy or your talk therapy do. Uh, it really can't do anything to the psychotic patient. Uh, it can't really get through to them un you know, without some other modality starting it. At that time, it was lobotomy. Today, uh, we're not uh, prescribing lobotomies for people with schizophrenia, but uh, psychotropic medications really do uh, start the process, but um, it is, it's important that psychotherapy be a part of that, uh, that treatment uh, as a whole. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, bmitchell at ivytech.edu or see me in class. Uh, thank you for your time and uh, I will see you in class. From the faculty, administration, support staff, student body, and the rest of Indiana, good luck on your quiz and enjoy learning about the rest of the wonderful art and science of psychology.